Tensions are escalating even more between Israel and Syria, especially since last night the Israeli Air Force struck more Hezbollah targets along the Syrian-Lebanese border. Strikes marked the second air raid in one day in less than 24 hours and the third since the beginning of the weekend. According to Syrian media sources, the Israeli Air Force was targeting Hezbollah weapons convoys uh, and Syrian military sites, but Israel has yet to confirm these claims. Now, the Syrian army has reportedly downed an Israeli reconnaissance drone shortly after it violated the Syrian airspace near the southeastern province of Qanetra. The area is close to the Golan Heights. And tension has been uh, rising, but it seems once again the Syrian army is confirming and sending a clear message that it is uh, always ready uh, to uh, uh, shoot down any Israeli, whether a drone, fighter jet or helicopter from now on. IDF chief Gadi Eisenkot is warning that Beirut will pay a heavy price for allowing Hezbollah to operate within its borders. In a statement released earlier today, Eisenkot said that in a future war, there will be a clear address, the state of Lebanon and the terror groups operating in its territory and under its authority. On Friday, Israeli planes struck a weapons convoy deep in Lebanon en route to Hezbollah. Yesterday, the IDF is believed to have carried out the assassination of a pro-Assad militant on the Syrian side of the Golan Heights. Eisenkot has warned that the Lebanese terror group has been bolstering its military capabilities and has been operating south of the Litani River near the border with Israel in violation of a UN ceasefire brokered in 2006 after the second Israeli-Lebanon war. Israel is set to deploy a new advanced anti-air defense system, David Sling, in the coming weeks. The announcement comes days after the Air Force was criticized for using the Arrow 3 missile system to shoot down a Syrian anti-air missile that crossed into Israeli territory. The Aero 3 was originally designed to be exclusively used against much larger intercontinental ballistic missiles, or ICBMs. Unlike the Iron Dome defense system, which is designed to shoot down small Qassam rockets and shells, and the Aero defense system designed for ICBMs, David Sling will be used against mid-sized missiles that tend to be used to take down aircraft. Syrian President Bashar al-Assad has criticized the U.S. policy on his country, saying Washington is only seeking to fulfill its own interests in Syria. American policy based on uh, many standards, not double. They have maybe 10 standards because they don't base their policy on values or on international law. They base it on their own vision, their own interests, uh, on the sometimes the balance of different lobbies and powers within the American institutions. Uh, the, we all know that. So we don't talk about uh, double standards. This is very normal for, for, the, for the U.S. Syria's President Bashar Assad has told RT that the White Helmets Rescue Group is part of the terror network Al-Qaeda. Responding to a question from one of our reporters, the Syrian leader gave a particularly forthright answer. White Helmets are Al-Qaeda. They are Al-Qaeda members, and that's proven on the, on the net. The same members are killing uh, or executing or celebrating over dead bodies. At the same time, they are humanitarian heroes. And now they have Oscar, as you know. Well, the White Helmets are media favourites and have been widely praised in the West for their humanitarian work in Syria's Aleppo. They recently featured too in an Oscar-winning documentary. However, the group has long been embroiled in controversy too, such as when uh, they celebrated, the, the celebrated rescuers were caught on camera waving black flags and chanting Islamist slogans. They're accused uh, also of lacking correct medical expertise after they posted a video by the White Helmets featuring uh, them conducting a surgery on a toddler. Medics say that the procedure was performed incorrectly, further endangering the child's life. Here's more now on the controversy surrounding the group. 
the Syrian first responders who risk their lives to save others in war-torn Aleppo. In the face of unrelenting brutality, heroes have emerged. They have all chosen to risk their lives to save others. Making the Syrian civil defense a candidate for the Nobel Peace Prize. North Korea has expanded the size of its uranium enrichment facility, signaling progress in the development of its nuclear weapons program. In an interview with the Wall Street Journal on Monday, Yukia Amano, the Director General of the International Atomic Energy Agency, said North Korea is rapidly developing its ability to produce nuclear weapons by advancing both its production of plutonium and its uranium enrichment. Amano said, citing satellite images, that Pyongyang has doubled the size of its existing uranium facility in Yongbyon on top of the separate uranium enrichment facility confirmed in 2010. He said the situation is very bad and it has gone into a new phase. As the alliance sets up a new force in response to Moscow's 2014 annexation of Crimea, a U.S. commander said on Monday that a U.S.-led battalion of more than 1,100 soldiers will be deployed in Poland from the start of April. More than 900 U.S. soldiers, around 150 British personnel, and some 120 Romanian troops will make up the battle group in northeastern Poland. It is one of four multinational formations across the Baltic region that Russia has condemned as an aggressive strategy on its frontiers. U.S. Army Lieutenant Colonel Stephen Gventner, who heads the battle group, told a news conference, This is a mission, not a cycle of training events. The purpose is to deter aggression in the Baltics and in Poland. We are fully ready to be lethal. Now, more trouble brewing. Turkey's presidents again compared Europe to the Nazis and a directly accused Angela Merkel of Nazi practices. EU leaders have been quick, of course, then, to respond to these scathing accusations. They would revive gas chambers and concentration camps if they weren't ashamed. That is their mentality. They are disturbed when they say that this is Nazi mentality. We cannot accept that our citizens are incited against each other with Nazi comparisons. This is the case for all countries in Europe. That's why we should say with clear words to Mr. Erdogan that he cannot continue like this. Germany's foreign minister earlier said Turkey is now further than ever from joining the EU. Our Europe correspondent Peter Oliver has more on the deteriorating relations. It seems at the moment like each new week brings a new barrage of Nazi name-calling coming from Ankara, from Turkey, towards European nations. This week, it does seem that it's Germany that's come in for uh, President Erdogan's ire. We've also seen the, one of the main Turkish newspapers run with a, a front cover uh, depicting German Chancellor Angela Merkel as, uh, as Adolf Hitler. Uh, these type of things have been described on Monday morning as simply unacceptable by the German Chancellor. Germany has blasted Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan, saying he has gone too far in an escalating diplomatic feud by accusing its Chancellor Angela Merkel of using Nazi measures. Merkel added that Germany reserves the right to take all necessary measures against the Turkish government. Merkel added that comments made by Turkish officials are, quote, breaking every taboo without consideration for the suffering of those who were persecuted and murdered by the Nazis. 
She stressed that appearances by Turkish politicians in Germany can only take place on the basis of German constitutional law. Theresa May will trigger Brexit, Brexit, Brexit. It's the news the UK had been waiting for, lighting up TVs and mobile phones all over the country. The UK will trigger Article 50 in just over a week's time, beginning this nation's long goodbye from the EU. Prime Minister Theresa May's next step is to write the most important letter of her political life, officially notifying the 27 other leaders of the EU that it's over. Right now, she's visiting Wales to reassure them their voice will be heard in negotiations with the EU. When people voted in the referendum last year, it wasn't just about leaving the EU. I think they did vote for change. They voted for a change in the way the country works, to make sure that it works for everyone, not just a privileged few. No winner on the night. That was the verdict by most viewers following a televised debate between France's five leading presidential candidates. That's not to say tempers didn't flare at times, but for the 40% of undecided voters, there was little to help them choose. One of the most heated exchanges involved the two front runners. Far right Marine Le Pen said France should oppose multiculturalism when the issue of the full body burkini swimsuit worn by some Muslims. Muslim women arose. It's an issue which created weeks of controversy in France last summer. Centrist and business-friendly Emmanuel Macron accused his rival of making enemies of Muslims and of twisting the truth. While opinion polls have Macron and Le Pen pulling away from the pack, former favourite, Conservative François Fillon, has dipped in popularity. His supporters saw the debate as a chance for him to rise above the scandal surrounding the employment of his wife and to resurrect his campaign. Only two candidates will go through from the April 23rd vote to the second round on May the 7th, but they're unlikely to be the Socialist Party's Benoit Hamon or leftist Jean-Luc Mélenchon, although the last Matters raise a wit went down well with viewers. It's the first time a televised debate has been held before the first round of a French presidential election. Voters will get a chance to see all 11 candidates on a TV special next month. Stephen Hawking has never been a fan of President Donald Trump. Last year, Hawking confessed to being bemused by Trump's rise and called him a demagogue who seems to appeal to the lowest common denominator. Website CNET reports that this week, however, the renowned British physicist went even further in suggesting that America is heading in a troubling direction. In a recent appearance on Good Morning Britain, Hawking shared that he thinks that Trump was elected by people who felt disenfranchised by the governing elite in a revolt against globalization. He also insisted that climate change is a central issue and one that Trump's administration is ignoring. Here's a question for you. Is there a new type of discrimination on the rise? Well, a New York City bar refusing to serve drinks to a customer just because he was wearing a red pro-Trump Make America Great Again hat. Greg Piatek was even asked to leave the bar after he told bartenders his support from for President Trump was not a joke. But you know what? Now he's fighting back. He's suing the bar. And his attorney, Paul Legere, is here. Paul, um, so the bartenders were repeatedly asked if it was a joke and... He was refused service. I mean, but doesn't the law say to that bar, yeah, you can kick people out if you want. You don't have to serve them. The law says that they can kick people out if they want. But what the law also says under the New York City Administrative Code is that they can't kick someone out based on creed. And if one were to take a look at the very dictionary definition of the word creed, that includes a set of political beliefs. This is a country that's based on freedom. And from the very onset and inception of this nation, our founding fathers wanted to ensure that people like my client would have the opportunity to speak. So given this is not a government actor, but the New York City law protects him. And moreover, bars like this in New York City should be judging my client by his personal character, not by his choice in political really candidates. On Monday, U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement officials said that the Travis County Sheriff's Office, located in Texas Capital County, has released 142 illegal immigrants for whom immigration officials had issued detainers in a single week. Officials reported that 206 criminally charged illegal immigrants were released from the custody of jails after an immigration detainer had been issued. Of those, 142 came from Travis County Sheriff Hernandez Jail. Over the weekend, Governor Abbott and put pressure on the Texas House of Representatives to pass a bill outlawing sanctuary jurisdictions in the state. Back here now to some breaking news about airline security. Word that at least one airline has orders from the U.S. government to ban all electronics except cell phones in the cabin is a terror threat prompting the move. 
ABC's David Curley on what we're learning tonight. This, a hole blown through a jetliner by a laptop, is the worry for U.S. security officials tonight. The U.S. reportedly ready to ban electronic devices from the cabins of jetliners arriving from certain airports. The news revealed in a tweet by Royal Jordanian Airlines apologizing to its customers, saying electronic devices will be strictly prohibited. That, according to the airline, covers laptops, tablets, cameras, DVD players, and electronic games, not phones or medical devices. One source telling ABC News the ban will apply to nearly a dozen countries and airports in the Middle Eastern region. And what's likely happened is that the, the government, the U.S. government, has developed some intelligence that a group or individual has developed some type of device that they can get onto an airplane using a laptop or some other electronic appliance. A little more than a year ago, it was a laptop with explosives that detonated shortly after takeoff in a Somali jetliner, blowing a hole in the fuselage, immediately depressurizing the cabin. And David joins us live now. David, do we know what prompted this new security procedure? Is there some type of terror threat out there? Well, this has been a threat they've been concerned about for a couple of years. And yes, there is new intelligence, according to sources, that terrorists potential terrorists may have perfected the technology of putting explosives in these devices, Tom. David Rockefeller, the world's oldest billionaire, died of heart failure Monday at the age of 101. He was the last grandson of John D. Rockefeller, founder of Standard Oil and America's first billionaire. David Rockefeller inherited a fortune from oil, but he also racked up accomplishments of his own. He had a doctorate in economics and was awarded the French Legion of Honor for his World War II military service. After the war, he joined Chase National Bank, eventually becoming the CEO after a merger created Chase Manhattan. His networking skills carried to international politics politics, where he became a confidant for Henry Kissinger, Nelson Mandela, and others. But these relationships sometimes had unintended consequences. Rockefeller helped convince President Jimmy Carter to let the deposed Shah of Iran get medical help in the U.S. in 1979. That decision ultimately led to the Iranian hostage crisis, in which followers of Ayatollah Rahullah Khomeini took over the U.S. Embassy in Tehran. Security forces have ended a deadly standoff between inmates and guards at a Guatemalan prison. The hostage situation began on Sunday when inmates took control of a prison located near the capital. Security forces have stormed the cells after negotiations ended in a stalemate. Three prison guards were killed. The protesting inmates, who are gang members, wanted better food and a transfer of 250 minors of the same gang from other prisoners. <laughs> Leading by example, but as Brazil's president tucked into home-produced meat to try to allay fears about hygiene, the international impact of a corruption scandal in the industry is growing. For as Michel Temer took foreign diplomats to a steakhouse, China and South Korea suspended some imports and the EU mulled action of its own against Brazilian meat. The Commission is in the process of ensuring that any of the establishment implicated in the fraud are suspended from exporting in the EU. Police are probing claims that health inspectors were bribed to overlook unsanitary conditions at several plants in a scandal that's tarnished Brazil's lucrative meat industry. Authorities insist there's no sanitary risk, despite allegations that some producers have sold rotten and tampered meat products. Police conducted raids on Friday and more than 30 people were arrested. The firms involved deny any wrongdoing, but the scandal deals a big blow to one of the few sectors in Brazil that's thrived during two years of recession. One car driver in Peru has a lucky escape trying to cross a swollen river. At least 75 people have died and more are missing during several days of torrential rain, which have caused the worst flooding in almost 30 years. A state of emergency has been declared across almost half of the country. At least 100,000 people have been left homeless. My house is full of mud. A rock hit my mother on her hip. She almost swallowed the water. We need help. Emergency camps have been set up near the capital, Lima. There are food and drinking water shortages in many areas and whole communities have been cut off by mudslides destroying roads and railway tracks. 
and the worst is not over. The country faces another month of flooding, blamed on a local El Nino weather phenomenon, which has already delivered 10 times as much rainfall than usual. In a freak accident in Ghana, a large tree fell on a group of people swimming near a waterfall, killing at least 18. Another 20 were reported injured in the accident on March 19th. The waterfall near the town of Kintampo is one of Ghana's top tourist destinations. Fireman Kwaku Botong told Reuters, quote, It was a horrifying scene as the area was engulfed in screams and shouts for help as we arrived. Botong went on to say that some witnesses had jumped in to help during the chaos as well. One eyewitness told Ghana Star News many of the victims were high school students. Some were tourists. A heavy rainstorm had hit the area not long before the accident. Ghana's tourism minister has announced an investigation, and President Nana Akufo Otto tweeted condolences to the victims' families. Hundreds of people in Colorado are heading back home after a massive wildfire forced them out. Crews have been battling the Sunshine Fire since it broke out Sunday morning and quickly spread. The cause of the fire is still being investigated. Tom Mustin from our Denver station KCNC is tracking the firefight near Boulder. Hey guys, yeah, we're here on the scene where the fire started and the good news is we just learned the Sunshine Fire is now 100% contained. We're here at the staging area at 4th and Mapleton. You can see Boulder law enforcement is here allowing residents to come back into their homes up the canyon. Now the good news, as I mentioned, that fire is now out. This was covered in haze all yesterday and early this morning. Now you can barely make it out because it is 100% contained. What is unusual now, this is one of our snowiest and wettest months in March. Now here's what firefighters are dealing with. Incredibly dry, tinderbox conditions. Usually this is covered in snow. So the good news is that that is, even though it's a bad uh, situation here, Mother Nature wise, this fire is out. But one firefighter told me what we're seeing here is we're seeing June in March, what doesn't bode well for the firefighting season here. And we just learned that, that the fire has been started in a transient camp area, which is hitting a lot of nerves here in Boulder because just last year the Netherlands fire started with two transients starting a fire in a camp as well. So that's definitely struck a nerve here. The fire is human caused, caused by transients, but the good news, it is now 100% contained and it somehow managed to avoid the several homes that are here despite the wind. Darkness settles in. The soft colors of morning quickly dampen and shadows sharpen. As you look up, the sun transforms into a black hole. Winter constellations appear, and the seldom seen corona, that ghostly halo of light that wraps around the sun's surface, becomes visible. The temperature plummets, causing birds to grow quiet, farm animals to shuffle in their barns, and crickets to begin their nightly tune. Now you're in the shadow of the moon. On August 21st, 2017, that shadow will sweep across North America as millions revel in a total solar eclipse. It's the first one to grace the continental United States since 1979, and the first to run from sea to shining sea since 1918. The shadow will glide across a strip roughly 4,000 kilometers long and 120 kilometers wide of solid and accessible ground. With so much land to cover, many anticipate it will be the most widely shared event in human history. There was the disaster, and then there was the rescue. The airman and the little girl, a hug and a smile, the chance encounter that lifted us all. After Katrina, Airman Mike Maroney deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan, where he always carried that picture along because, he told us, it lifted him up too in bad times, even on the day it was taken. I don't even know if I was on a planet at that time. I was just in that hug. In 2015, Mike set out to find the girl he saved. He didn't even know her name. Well, her name is Lachey Brown, and they found each other on the real TV show. She had changed a lot more than he had, and he wanted her to know something about who saved whom. You rescued me more than I rescued you. Mike's become a true friend to Lachey since then. She's been inspired to join the military, starting with her high school's junior ROTC program, where at this weekend's big banquet, here, here. Mike, now the one who looks different, came along as her guest. He's retiring soon from the Air Force, but still helping Lachey figure out her future. I knew that he was more experienced and that he would help me along the way. That's what can happen when a chance encounter becomes a story with chapters yet to be written.